lovely to hear all the hubbub and the chat as everybody arrives. And I've got an intimation today. It's a long time since we've had intimations, partly because there wasn't an awful lot happening. I know some of you have been handed it as you come in, but I'm going to read it out for the benefit of those that are at home as well. I'll need my glasses for this one. It's about Christian Aid. So the Christian Aid Committee are holding a tabletop sale in the grounds of St. Margaret's Church on Saturday, 14th August, from 10 to 12 noon. We would be grateful for donations for any of the stalls, jigsaws, books, toys and games, craft stall, plants, cake and candy. It must be bagged and priced. And donations can be handed in on the morning of the sale or contact Dorothy Hutchin. There's a phone number here, 468034 or Linda Gray, 464039. Okay, so you should have been given a copy of this as you arrived in your wee signing in bag. But... For those at home, the details are there if you want to rewind and write down the phone numbers. Thank you. It is good to come together as God's family. In fact, when Peter writes a letter in the Bible, he tells us these words. He says, but you are the chosen race, the king's priests the holy nation, God's own people, chosen to proclaim the wonderful acts of God who called you out of darkness into his own marvelous light. So we come this morning and it doesn't matter a jot about social status. We come not as kings and queens or lords and ladies. It doesn't matter what our background is. Because we come to a place to be God's people where class is ignored, where age is ignored, where gender is ignored. We come called as we are to be God's people, his chosen people. And as we draw close to God, we realize that it doesn't matter how broken and flawed we are as we come. He doesn't usually leave us the way that we were when we came. And over our lifespan, he gently changes us, molds us into the people that he's really called us to be. So as we come this morning, we recognize that we need to focus on the Lord Jesus Christ if we're ever to be the people that he's called us to be. So we're going to start by standing and singing together, Focus My Eyes on You, O oh Lord. <laughs> Your word tells us that even the hairs on our heads are numbered. 
You know us better than we know ourselves, with all of the flaws, and yet still you call us. Lord, this morning we come with humble hearts to say thank you for your persistence. Thank you for your great love. Lord, we ask this morning that we would feel your presence moving in this place, that you would speak right into our very hearts, into our lives, into our minds, that you would touch us, that you would show us the flaws that we need to be trying to sort out with your help, and that you would bring us in all of your glory into the people that we need to be to bring you glory. Forgive us, Lord, when we get it all so wrong. Forgive us when we try to do it our way and stumble and fall, even with the best of intent. Help us to acknowledge that your presence is here, right here, and to hold, your, hold you close today and every day. We ask in Jesus' name, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who are in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's been great having our marquees outside because at a time when it's been hard to come together, when we've got all of the kind of COVID restrictions, some of which are still in place, it's given us the opportunity to do things. And especially for our younger people as well, because it's been hard for us to keep in touch, certainly on a personal level, with all of the restrictions in place. It was great that last week, Teen Scene managed to get together and, and, and enjoy having the marquees outside. And of course, all the way through the summer, we've had our breakfast club running as well. Now, it has to be said, and I don't know if you can see my little red dot there, but for this little fella here, who would have known that eating could have been such an art form? I don't know if you can see it as close as I'm seeing it, but look at that little face. I don't know what he was eating that morning, but it really does look quite spectacular. And then the other little fella helping to clean up. Well, I mean, come on, come on. And it has been wonderful every morning to hear all of the little voices, to see all of them out of there playing. But what we forget is that God's people, when they were finally together, as a nation, albeit that they didn't have a land at that time, they didn't have a country at that time, but when God brings them out of Egypt into the desert, well, the first worship took place in tents. They lived in tents. They were living for 40 years in the desert. They had to be able to move around to be able to find places that they had enough food to sustain them. And God led them and moved them on. And worship, worship, well, the focus of the worship was a great big ginormous tent. I reckon it must have been about the size of the two that we have out there put together, just like we have done. Why do I think it was so big? Well, it had a whole pile of stuff in it. It had the, something called the covenant box. Remember Moses got the Ten Commandments on pillars? Well, they were in the box. That must have been heavy. And I couldn't find anything the exact size of the box. So for all of you young people this morning, I need you to use your imagination a bit. But if I get my tape measure, so imagine, now we're not going to take a saw and chop up the communion table. Not today, okay? We're not going to do that. But imagine that I did have a saw and I could chop it up a bit, okay? So this big box would have been, so from that end, a bit about this long, so we'd have to chop that off, okay? So, got this bit. It would have been about as deep as it is, so we don't have to chop anything off of that. And height-wise, it would have been 
Let me put this down a wee bitty to about there. It would have been about that high. So I would have only had to take this bit off, but it had a big lid that was all decorative as well. So it was huge. And it was on great big poles to help them to carry it. Can you imagine carrying that around every time that they used? The other thing is, the Bible gave them instructions about how to put the tent up. Let me show you something. That's the instructions we got of how to put the tents up outside. Anybody speak German? I did all grade German at school, but I can't really get my head around all of this. And thankfully, there was a page that had numbers on it, three pages of parts. I don't need that anymore. I can tell you every wing nut, every screw, every washer, the size of every different pole, and they're heavy. And yet the Bible has all of the details for building the great big huge tent that Moses had. There was a little bit that was what was kind of like the Holy of Holies, where all of these kind of special artifacts were kept. And all of the sacrifices took place there. It was where they focused on God. In fact, God even used to come and show up and meet with Moses in the tent. Sometimes when people were a bit busy going about the day and they saw Moses going in, they would stop and they would wait and they would listen. And they would wait when Moses came out to see if he had anything special to tell them, if God had been telling him something really, really special. And so they believed that because God's presence would show up in the tent, that the tent was the place where heaven and earth came together, where God met with them. And then much, much later, when they got a land of their own and they built the temple... They then believed that the temple was the place where heaven and earth met, where God would live and meet with them. Not so good for people that lived a long way away from the temple, though. They couldn't lift that up and carry it around to where they are. But here's the great thing, is that Jesus did away with all of that. Because, you see, the Lord Jesus Christ is the place where heaven and earth meet. And it doesn't matter... If we're in a tent, or if we're at home this morning, or if we're here this morning, because he sent his Holy Spirit, he can be right where we are. And what's more, the Bible tells us that he will be right where we are when we call on him, because he's called on us. And when we do call on him and take that time with him, and grow close to him, then we become what that little passage at the beginning said, set apart. Well, it doesn't mean to say that we're pushed in a little closet or a room on our own. It means that we become special in God's sight. And he helps us. He helps us to live a life that's better for us. And it's also better for all of the people that are around about us as well. He's called us to live his way, and he's quite happy to meet us all the time, be with us all the time to help us to live his way. It's a brilliant song. You have called us out of darkness. It's a good going one. We've got a bit, we can get a bit of a rhythm going here. I'll, I'll get you all clapping along as well. So let's stand and sing together. You have called us out of darkness.
a short Bible reading today, and it's a very, very strange one. It's the kind of thing, to be honest, that most, I guess, ministers, most of us, when we're having our Bible readings, kind of flick through. I find Exodus quite a traumatic book because it's full of repetition and instructions for building stuff, and you kind of go, yeah, 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 let's get on to the meaty bit. But this is a strange little passage, and, and, and you'll understand just shortly why I thought it would be good to have a quick look at it. It's headed the anointing oil. The Lord said to Moses, take the finest spices, six kilograms of liquid myrrh, three kilograms of sweet-smelling cinnamon, three kilograms of sweet-smelling cane, and three kilograms of cassia all weighed according to the official standard. Add four liters of olive oil and make a sacred anointing oil. Mix like perfume. Use it to anoint the tent of my presence, the covenant box, the table and all its equipment, the lampstand and its equipment, the altar for burning incense, the altar for burning offerings, together with all its equipment, and the wash basin with its base. Then anoint Aaron and his sons and ordain them as priests in my service. Say to the people of Israel, this holy anointing oil is to be used in my service for all time to come. Amen. So let's talk to God. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for your word and we thank you for your instruction. We thank you that you have called us. You've called us to live in a real world with real issues and real brokenness and real hurt and real pain and tragedy. And yet, Lord, you delight in us and you laugh when we laugh and you hurt when we hurt. And today, Lord, we pray for all of those who are hurting for whatever reason. We pray for other nations around the world As all of our nations struggle to get to grips with this pandemic, there are other issues as well. 
And in many instances, as communities, as society, we've taken our eye off the ball because we've been distracted by the other things that have been going on. But you haven't, Lord. You haven't. And so, Lord, we pray today for those who are living in difficult, difficult circumstances, whatever they are. We pray, Lord, for rulers around the world, that you would give them your heart for people instead of their heart for power. We pray, Lord, that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we pray for those that we know, our families, our friends, our neighbors, people in our communities, those that we carry in our heart, and we pray that you would help them through whatever their circumstances are today. And we take a few moments of silence as we name them in our minds. Lord, we pray too for those who are here and for those who are watching at home that they would see your hand at work in their lives, that they would see your hand at work in our communities. Lord, we pray for your church worldwide. We pray for your church in Scotland and we pray for your church right here in this place where we live. And we pray that you would enable us to be those people that you have called us to be, that we would build your kingdom right where we are. Lord, as we turn to your word later, we pray that it would speak to us, these strange words, written for a different people, different time, different generation. However, we pray, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts today. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to stand and sing together. The church is wherever God's people are praising. have heard quite a lot on the news recently about this whole notion of what they call a a vaccine passport, 
whether it be some kind of paper document or some kind of app on a phone. Something that will allow us to go to other countries, something that will allow us to enter public events because we can prove that we've had two shots of the vaccine. But there are also those who raise their eyebrows and say, no, this would actually change our society into a two-tier society. The haves and the have-nots, the cans and the can-nots, if you like. And it would mean that one group of people would be seen to be kind of set apart, kind of more special, allowed to do special things. Interestingly, that's exactly what that little verse that we read at the beginning of the service is telling us that God wants us to be, a people who are set apart. However, we still live in a real world. So how is that going to work? And how can we be set apart? And how can we sustain that? When God's people were rescued from Egypt and moved into the desert, I guess it was easy for them to be set apart. There was nobody else there. And yet it wasn't that easy for them to live as God's people. And a lot of the, the early passages in the Old Testament, Exodus, Leviticus, talk about how they struggle. And I have to say that struggle continues as they try to live as God's people. In a sense, you could almost split it into two different sections because you've got the rescue from Egypt, which is all about what God has done for his people. And then you have this other bit where they make a deal with God, a, co a covenant arrangement, which is all in a sense about what his people will do for God and how they will live in relationship together. As God tries them to help them to live in relationship with him, but also in relationship with one another. Real people, tough times, not so easy. And so we come to this business where they are trying to, I guess in a sense, bring some kind of form and order into worship. You must always remember, please don't forget this, that a lot of the traditions and customs from Egypt seem to travel with them and are still in our, and in this country too, in our modern day society as well. For example, the anointing and the use of oil to anoint. Queen Elizabeth was anointed to rule. The Egyptians loved ritual. If you look way, way, way back at ancient history, some of it predating the rescue from Egypt, you will see that the Egyptians loved, they loved ritual, they loved ceremonies, and they would make up all kinds of, of practices to go with that. And interestingly, we need to remember that Moses and Aaron grew up to manhood in Egypt. In Egypt, the priests were anointed with oil to become priests. In Egypt, the pharaohs were anointed to rule. There were special ceremonies, special recipes for anointing oil. And over and above that, the priests used to anoint statues of the pharaohs that were dead already, the ones that had gone before. And if the living pharaohs wanted to go and see these statues, they had to go through a special ceremony and process and had to be specially anointed to do it, and they too would have to anoint 
the statues as well. Loads of ritual. Does that sound familiar? And sometimes I have wondered, and many will disagree because there's massive debate as to some of the stuff in the Old Testament, but sometimes I have wondered how much God just permits rather than instructs. Because none of those people that were there would have been unfamiliar with artifacts being anointed. There are instructions for the building of the tent, as I said earlier. Although many, many archaeologists wonder where, if the tent was made with one piece of material, where they got that in the desert to start with. And wondered if perhaps the writers that wrote it all down, perhaps looking back, because remember it was only written down hundreds of years after it happened, slightly embellished things. It's possible. However, all of the artifacts that were used were anointed with this special oil and set apart. Interestingly, there are some denominations who still anoint chalices, communion cups, church furniture, church buildings, if a Church of Scotland was to open in a new building today, if we were to do a church plant somewhere, it wouldn't be anointed with oil, but it would be dedicated for God's service and for his holy use. I was on holiday in the days that we were allowed to do things like that in England one time, and I was visiting an old church, beautiful, beautiful building, and a, 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 an elderly member of the church was giving me a guided tour. That's the kind of thing that they volunteered for every week. And it was interesting to hear about this old building. And I happened to see, which is kind of more what I'm interested in, so it, do you have lots of people come? Are there lots of people come here to worship? Trying to imagine this place full of people. No, 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 hardly anybody now. Place is more or less empty apart from folks that are coming to look at the building. Okay. And I said, well, what happens long time? They had a little kind of gift box out there. And I said, well, what's going to happen then long term if you can't afford to keep the building? And he simply said, well, the building has to be kept because it's been consecrated and it's been anointed and it's on sacred land. And I had to stop myself from giggling like anything. So in the actual fact, it was people that God called to be in relationship. You know, really, it wasn't an old relic of a building, no matter how beautiful the old building is. But perhaps we can see where this has come in to Christian culture, even today even today. And then there is Aaron and his sons. And it's interesting that they're mentioned like much further down the food chain because all of the bits of um, church furniture, all of the bits of stuff that's used for sacrifices and stuff, they seem to be mentioned first. And then comes Aaron. And he is to be anointed. And we need to understand that this anointing oil is being used as a spiritual, for a spiritual purpose, to put a mark upon Aaron that says he is now set apart for God's purposes. He's being, if you like, ordained and anointed as a priest. But we shouldn't think that this is just about church ministers or people that are good at Bible study or something like this, because there are wider implications for everyone. When you stop to think what it is that Aaron has been set apart to do, he's kind of set apart to be a middleman between God and the people. Yes, he will be allowed to go into that holy tent. It's got to be big enough 
because that's where they're going to bring the sacrifices. That's what the wash basins are about. I often wondered if the anointing oil was made to smell sweet because it must have been kind of stinky around there. Maybe that's why they had to clean up. It was a little bit, do you not remember when we were being told how we've got to clean surfaces and clean our hands and wear a mask? There was a little bit of that in there when it's talking about this kind of ritual that they've got to go through. And Aaron's going to receive gifts, sacrificial gifts from the people. And then he is going to take these sacrificial gifts to God as an act of worship to God, as an act of contrition, if you like, before God on behalf of the people, serving God, it's Godward. And then in return, the people having made the sacrifice, then receive cleansing and forgiveness. And by doing that, they are now set apart as God's people. So it's not necessarily about the anointing oil. It's about that relationship with God. Interestingly, sacrificial ceremony was an Egyptian pagan habit, custom as well. But here's the thing. We know that Aaron and his sons made loads of mistakes. We know that many of the people who were anointed as priests in the following years, and many of the people who were anointed as kings broke that mark, that seal of anointing, and did their own thing. Some of them even worshipped pieces of wood, false gods, idols. So we've got to understand that the anointing oil itself is what it is. It's a bunch of ingredients. It's not a magic potion. And there's nothing in that oil on its own that's going to make a difference in that person's life. So what about us? And what about that little verse that we read at the beginning about Peter saying that we've been called to be set apart, called out of darkness into the light? What about us? Are we supposed to have some kind of special oil? Offer some kind of special sacrifice? Well, we need to understand that Jesus has done away with all of that. Gosh, even by the time of Isaiah, God was so fed up with these practices that I guess he'd allowed for a long time, but were no more than empty ritual. Because ritual doesn't necessarily lead to relationship. Relationship means taking time out. Relationship means getting to know someone, getting to know their heart. I have loved, even though I was on holiday, being out there at breakfast club, meeting new people, getting to know them. Other people that I've known to say hello to for a while, getting to know them better. It's about relationship. And to be set apart as God's people is about relationship. And it's about relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Not about empty ritual. Not about whether we're in a building like this or whether we're in a tent. It's about drawing close to God. It's about priorities. So we need to ask ourselves some simple questions. What are our priorities? What's the first thing we think about when we wake up in the morning? I'm oh, sorry, I mean after we've rushed to the bathroom. When you're a certain age in particular. So what's the first thing you think about? Is it about dashing off out into the day? I've got to do this, I've got to do that. Are you already men making your mental list of to-dos? Who's the first person that you speak to? In my case, it's usually the dog. <laughs> but it's only because I'd probably stand on it when my feet go out of the bed. 
because she's usually there waiting for me to get up, knowing that she's going to get fed. But who's the first person that you speak to? What is it that takes up most of your day? Now, I understand that we've all got jobs to do, that we're at work. I get that. And, and we have to focus, and we get that as well. And God gets that too. But what about the times when we're not having to focus? What do we do when we come home in the evening? Especially when there's nothing good on the telly. What do we do before we fall asleep at night? And where do we fit God into there? Where do we speak to the Lord Jesus Christ? Because if you personally, I don't need you to write the answers on a postcard, by the way, because I have to answer those same questions as well. But if you go through that list in your mind and work out where does God come into that? And what happened yesterday? Did he get shoved into today? Or what happened last week? Did he get shoved to today? And if that's the case, then maybe our priorities are all a wee bit skewed if we are genuinely going to be set apart as God's people and be part of God's family. Now, I know that we live busy, busy lifestyles. I get that. Me too. But I also know that there are some here, many here, who will take the time to look at a bit of scripture, to talk about it together. Feel free to ask questions. Nobble me. I love talking about scripture. Love it. So, I, unfortunately, you've got to tell me to shut up, though. So if you ask me a question, you've got to say, oh, that's enough. That's enough. You know? Because I don't know about you, there's lots of bits of Scripture you think, what? What is that all about? That's why times like this are good. That's like times when we can come together are brilliant because we can talk to one another. Once we sort those priorities out and do what we sang at the beginning, focus my eyes on you, O Lord, then we start to get more into the relationship mode. Remember this. God's focus is you. God's focus all the time is you. That then means that if we feel far away from God, we are the ones that need to move and make time. And it doesn't matter if it's about being together in church. You know what? I can't remember the last time that I had the chance to get together in a big crowd at one of these conferences and sing at the top of my voice and not be able to hear myself because other people are all singing louder. Wonderful. But it doesn't matter whether you're there, whether you're on your own. It doesn't matter how old you are. What matters is that we take time out for God. You know what happened with God's nation? Oh, they went to great lengths. There were rules about intermarrying. There were rules about who they could and couldn't meet with or have a lot among them. Although by the time you get to Isaiah, you're talking about accepting the alien. So many rules to make them special. And the only people that stopped them from being special was themselves. The only people that stop us, stop us from being set apart is ourselves. God's not asking us to be set apart as in go and be a monk or a nun and be locked away. He's asking us to live in a real world on his behalf with his spirit enabling and helping. Then we become that holy nation, the royal priesthood. You know when you hear them at football matches saying we're God's own people? Nah, you're not. God called you out of darkness. We are God's people, his family, called to live for today. Let us pray. 
Loving God, we thank you that your calling is strong and your calling is true. Forgive us when our priorities have all been tipped upside down. It's part of who we are as human beings. Forgive us when we have pushed you out more and more and more, sometimes even while we're serving you. And help us instead to keep you in front, right at the center. Help us instead to keep you as our focus. Help us instead to worship you wherever we are, for wherever we are, you have promised to be. And just as surely as you accompanied your people through the desert, with a cloud by day and a pillar of fire at night. Your presence is just as strong with us today. Help us to be aware of it and help us to be your people set apart for you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Just take a moment as we receive our offering. Let us pray. Lord, we again thank you for your many gifts and blessings. Lord, may this never become an empty ritual. But may, may we come and thank you from the bottom of our hearts every week. For you have blessed us greatly, even in these tough times. We thank you for blessing us with the marquees that have opened the door for so many opportunities during this tough time. We thank you for blessing us with one another as family. And it's great to be able to be starting to see each other face to face as we long for the day that we see you face to face. Lord, accept the gifts that we bring today. Increase them, Lord, that we can do ever more for you as your people, building your kingdom set apart for you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And we close this morning by singing that brilliant hymn, God is our strength and refuge. <coughs>
So now may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us evermore. Amen.